Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Dr. Scott Hoy, clinical psychologist, and Kyle Miller, licensed counselor. Psychology Talk is a unique conversation about psychology around the globe. We speak with psychology experts to keep you informed about current issues and trends. We advocate toward reducing stigma and educate about mental health. While you're listening, please take a moment to give us a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming service. It helps us to continue providing you with quality programming. And now, enjoy the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jeremy Narby. Dr. Narby is a Canadian anthropologist and author. In his books, Dr. Narby examines shamanism, molecular biology, and shaman's knowledge of botanics and biology through the use of entheogens across many cultures. He grew up in Canada and Switzerland and studied history at the University of Kent in Canterbury and received his doctorate in anthropology from Stanford University. He works as the Amazonian Projects Director for the Swiss NGO Nouvelle Planète. He's the author of several books, including The Cosmic Serpent, DNA, and the Origins of Knowledge. Today, he will be discussing his new book, Plant Teachers, Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge, which he co-authored with Rafael Chanchari Pizzuri, an elder of the Shawi people of Peru. Dr. Narbi, a hearty welcome to the show. Well, Scott, it's a pleasure to be with you. Okay. Well, uh, certainly, uh, we kind of like to have the show open up. You could talk about yourself. You could talk about your, your book, uh, which would be great, which I happen to have the pleasure of reading, uh, or any topic you think would be important for you. Oh, um, I'm happy to talk about... Um, uh, what you mentioned, these uh, plants to start with, yeah. uh, tobacco and ayahuasca, and how indigenous Amazonian people understand them, and how people in the Western world understand them, and the differences between those two um, systems of knowledge, one could say. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I, I, what I was fascinated by was, was certainly the take on tobacco uh, as a former smoker, who uh, heartily enjoyed his tobacco habit for some years. Uh, I don't think Philip Morris had the same take on tobacco that indigenous people have. Uh, and certainly I, what I was imbibing was not, I guess, uh, very much of, of what they were imbibing, which you go into in great detail, uh, uh, a very approachable look at the chemistry of tobacco and ayahuasca. But maybe you could, you could kind of discuss that. What is tobacco really? Well, um, this is where I'd um, rewind, rewind the tape of history, um, you know, go back to the beginning of the story and start with uh, the indigenous Amazonian perspective. Um, tobacco is a South American plant. Uh, there are different species of tobacco, but the tobacco that uh, people smoke is usually nicotiana tabacum or else nicotiana rustica. And these are frankly South American, indeed Peruvian foothill of the Andes, but still tropical Amazon. Uh, that seems to be where these plants originated in the wild. And that's where the people who ended up uh, living there, perhaps uh, 10,000 years ago or who knows, um, domesticated uh, these plants and then started using them. And they've been using them for a, a very long time. Tobacco, and this is something probably um, uh, most people don't know. I mean, when you, when you ask people about Amazonian shamanism, sometimes they, they don't even know what you're talking about. But those who do, they'll say, oh, yes, ayahuasca. Yeah. Um, but uh, in, in the Amazon, really, um, uh, tobacco is the number one shamanic plant. And um, it's considered the number one medicinal plant. It's a painkiller. Uh, people apply the uh, leaves to uh, wounds to, 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 to help calm the pain, quite simply. Uh, people blow smoke on uh, people who have fever uh, to calm them, to soothe them. So uh, tobacco is used by indigenous Amazonian people as a, as a medicinal plant, 
and also as a what they call a plant teacher, a powerful plant that teaches shamans um, different things. Uh, so what does this mean? Uh, th we can already see this. There's a difference. Here. I'll, I'll briefly talk about eventually white man ended up um, taking indigenous American tobacco because this tobacco ended up going going north and reaching the indigenous people of the Americas. There was also native tobaccos in North America. So it's a, a long, complicated story. But in brief, the powerful, dark, shamanic tobaccos of the indigenous Americans uh, was watered down by the folks in on the East Coast. Uh, you know, Virginia tobacco, blonde tobacco. It contains maybe 1% uh, nicotine, in, in its leaves compared to the dark tobacco that has like 20%. Oh. And so going back to the Amazon, w when you smoke this dark uh, shamanic tobacco, it is powerful. And it, it is probably uh, appropriately classified as a hallucinogen. Oh, okay. You know, people, people don't think of tobacco as a hallucinogen. But when you're dealing with this powerful dark stuff, you, you get into that territory. And um, the people that I lived with when I was a young anthropologist, the uh, Ashaninka, they take tobacco in all kinds of ways, in, including as a kind of jam. They boil it down into a, a paste, and, and then they, they take um, little, little stick hits off of a stick they st stick a stick into the paste mm -hmm. and then put it run it through their lips and voila and you can get a sort of a strong dose of this stuff kind of makes the the whiskers on your chest grow it makes your your heart race um it, it has a, a deep impact on, on the body and uh, and on the mind it, it's um uh, quite impressive and so indigenous Amazonian shamans have been using this powerful plant uh, for a long time, and they consider it to be one of the most important plant teachers. Wow. Okay. Well, so, so what is this plant teacher thing? I mean, you know, most people in the Western world, when you, if you say, oh, yes, this plant taught me that uh, you, you can't even finish your sentence and they, they think you're nuts. Um, but in the Amazonian shamanic view, a plant teacher is what we might call a psychoactive plant, mm -hmm. a plant that has an impact on your mind. And so that when you ingest it, um, you see things, you see, think things that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, it's a psychoactive, it, it activates your neurons and um, so then it takes you into a new way of thinking and of understanding. And they, they view that as a learning experience, and they consider the plant quite simply as a, a teacher in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, and tobacco is considered uh, the, the number one plant teacher, uh, if only because tobacco is, is uh, widely recognized as a, a combo plant. It's a plant that... Uh, you use with other teacher plants. And, and actually, you'll find this, uh, you know, uh, when people drink wine, they'll smoke tobacco. Uh, when people smoke hashish, they'll smoke tobacco too and, and mix it in. Tobacco lends itself to being consumed at the same time as other psychoactive plants. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the case with ayahuasca as well. Um, Almost all indigenous ayahuasqueros in the Amazon would not dream of taking ayahuasca without having tobacco on hand at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the session. Um, so that is also why uh, tobacco is the number one uh, shamanic plant, because it's used with all other powerful plants, and it's also used uh, by itself. So... Um, among the Ashaninka people that I was living with, the, the word for shaman uh, in their language was sheri piari. Sheri means tobacco. Piari is like the doctor or the one who knows. So you go and see the tobacco doctor. You have a problem. Uh, you're, you've got a fever. 
uh, you can't shoot straight with your arrow, so your hunting is off. Uh, any kind of preoccupation like this, you go and see the tobacco doctor. And the tobacco doctor will, uh, first of all, smoke some tobacco and think about it. Uh, tobacco also serves uh, f for uh, posing a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. So this is how Amazonian people consider um, tobacco. And they use it uh, with a lot of uh, respect and also fear. I mean, it's quite clear to people that this is an ambiguous plant. It, it can also mislead you. There's a lot of people who get caught up in power games and what can be called sorcery with, with tobacco. I mean, it, it, it uh, amplifies what's there. And if you're a power-hungry, aggressive person, it's not going to make you any less power-hungry and, and uh, aggressive. So it's uh, Amazonian people recognize that these plants, and in particular tobacco, are uh, ambiguous certainly dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're master plants in the sense that you never master them. Um, mm -hmm. They they can master you, and that's what you gotta you got to watch out, that they don't do that. Okay. Um, so why work with these powerful, dangerous plants if, you know, you can't master them and they can master you? Well, because you can get information from them and points of view that you, you couldn't otherwise. So you... You know, you, you go up close to this powerful, dangerous being, you ingest it, but you do it prudently. You do it, you, you, you put a kind of a harness on the experience. You limit it in, in space and time. You don't do it all day long um, without thinking about it. If you're going to be uh, uh, starting to have a relationship with a, a plant like tobacco, uh, you need to be aware of of what you're doing. You're you're dealing with a very powerful entity that can that can kick your butt and and mislead you. And uh, so you you want to do it um, uh, well. You want to be forewarned uh, about it. And so there's a whole sort of people don't do tobacco for pleasure. Uh -huh. uh, it's 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 not uh, you know it's not for a habit. It's not for a pleasure. It's not that kind of thing. Um, it's the kind of thing that you do deliberately at certain moments for with a certain intention, and and, and it's an intense experience. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds okay. like you 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 really, as an anthropologist, you really uh, became part of the experience phenomenologically. You you, you were with the shamans. You and you, you talk about it yeah. in the book of like your own experience yeah, with yeah. tobacco. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the. I mean, clearly the the, the method. If you want to, you know, I, I crossed the line a long time ago uh, because it, it used to be that still in the uh, 20th century, back in the 20th century, anthropology was busy trying to prove that it was a science, and so anthropologists were in this strange position where they go and and hang out with these irrational people in the rainforest mm -hmm. uh, who would be saying all kinds of strange things. Mm -hmm. But um, they wanted to be as objective as possible. So it made it very difficult to have first person hallucinogenic experience with, with the natives. Mm -hmm. And anth anthropologists who crossed that line uh, quickly ran into trouble. I mean, Castaneda ran into trouble, but he, he also fictionalized somewhat. So that was also part of the problem. But a guy like Michael Harner ran into trouble, mm -hmm. not because his work wasn't uh, exact, but simply because he had crossed that line and started taking it a little bit too seriously. Uh, Stephen Lyons, uh, uh, are you familiar with Stephen Lyons, who's were, uh -huh. written a wonderful book called Spirit Talkers? Uh, mm -hmm. He talks, he, he uh, writes at great length about how, uh, yes, indeed, uh, people crossed that line and, and there was a... Uh, they put the kibosh on on doing that at some point. Yes, yeah. Uh, but but uh, he goes he goes into great detail about uh, the experience of uh, stepping into a different uh, Weltanschauung or a different you know sort of phenomenological experience, and it's just as valid as the the Western paradigm, what we call the Western paradigm now. Yeah, well, I, you know, I spent, um, I'm still negotiating, uh, going back and forth between those two worldviews. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'll, I'll just say that it's true that uh, after spending a couple of years with Ashaninka people and trying the ayahuasca, trying the tobacco, mm -hmm. seeing that there was something there that was not uh, uh, charted by the uh, Western, you know, paradigm, um, that there was something strong, powerful, uh, full of information, but that escaped uh, academic psychology, anthropology, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, I actually hardly mentioned ayahuasca in my PhD dissertation about the rational uses of the rainforest by the Ashaninka people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it took me um, well, several more years working as an activist and fundraiser for indigenous Amazonian people to, to realize that um, uh, it, not talking about the hallucinogenic origin of part of their knowledge um, was a, a misrepresentation because I, I was going around raising funds in Europe in, in the early 1990s saying that the best way to protect the rainforest was to entrust it to its indigenous inhabitants who were the only ones to use it rationally, mm -hmm. which was true. They were the only ones who used the rainforest productively without destroying it. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I knew that I was not saying that they themselves say that at the heart of their knowledge about plants and animals in the rainforest are these plant teachers that teach them what they need to know. Um, so I wrote a book called The Cosmic Serpent in the middle of the 1990s that, that deals with that, that tried to put that question on the table. And, and, then, so, and now it's become... Um, more acceptable, one could say that. So ayahuasca has suddenly it's on the table. It's been on the table for the last uh, 20, 25 years or so. Um, mm -hmm. And people are recognizing that it's a, it has a very strong therapeutic potential and, and so on. There, there's been a whole explosion of scientific research on ayahuasca in the, in, in the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, uh, one could say business is good for those who want to sort of go back and forth between indigenous Amazonian knowledge and scientific knowledge. Well, um, it, it, whereas 25 uh, years ago, it, it, that that was nowhere. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I think there's more of an acceptance of alternative perspectives from the kind of monolithic uh, culture that we have uh, in forced upon us. I mean, I think our, our minds have been colonized, you know, in, in many ways. We, uh, the animism that you discuss in the book uh, and the ability with your co-author in the book to step back and forth between microbiology and, and, and uh, uh, Western scientific perspective, which I think was fascinating. You mentioned that uh, he was able to, he thinks in terms of science with Spanish, but then he uses his native tongue to speak in terms of uh, kind of an animistic perspective. Uh, I, I think uh, one of the things I was going to ask you is we talked about what tobacco was. What is ayahuasca to you from your experience of, of uh, indigenous populations and perspectives? And, sure. And, you know, um, if I may, I, I just finished with tobacco because I, I was oh. only halfway there, and then we started talking about crossing the line. So I'll just finish. I'll just finish the tobacco, uh, and I'll go straight into ayahuasca. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I sketched tobacco as it as it is in indigenous Amazonia, mm -hmm. where it comes from, how it's been used there for thousand thousands of years, and still is used there right now. Meanwhile. In Virginia, three four hundred years ago, um, the uh, for uh, European Americans, white Americans who arrived and colonized, cultivated the plant and weakened it. Uh, they didn't like the the strong shamanic head spinning uh, version, and so they selected blonde weaker and and selected it down so that uh, blonde tobacco has one percent nicotine it's not really a powerful shamanic mm -hmm. experience and then in the 20th century uh western industrialized tobacco was turned into cigarettes cigarettes are nicotine delivery devices this is how these industry talks about them but 
delivery de devices that are calibrated to deliver just enough nicotine to tickle the neurons, but never to actually fire them up. Like a, a motorcycle that goes bam, 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 mm -hmm. and, and you never get the gear that, that sort of g gets in. And so, uh, and cigarettes are deliberately calibrated in this way so that you're motivated to fire up another one as soon as possible. So in other words, more dopamine. You, you, get, yeah. you get the tickling effect, yeah. uh, but then you don't get the delivery. And so, oh, well, maybe I'll have another one. And meanwhile, this um, weakened form of this powerful plant is then all sauced up with hundreds of different chemicals that when you, when you burn them, which is what happens when you smoke a cigarette, they turn into these uh, dangerous carcinogenic uh, substances. Mm -hmm. it, it should be said, nicotine is not uh, the cause of cancer. Nicotine is not innocent. It can increase uh, the risk of diabetes, for example. Uh, but uh, to our knowledge, nicotine is not the, the cause of cancer. It's the, it's the TARS and it's the, the byproducts of, of these different chemicals that are added in to the, to the cigarettes. So uh, what Western people have come to think of with to, of tobacco, you know, cigarettes, in other words, this is uh, a watered-down, adulterated uh, uh, form of a powerful plant um, uh, it, that used to be a teacher plant in its original context, but when taken like this, teaches you nothing, and then all sauced up with, in dangerous chemicals. So... So then you think, well, wait a minute, how stupid, how stupid can you be to take uh, a powerful, dangerous uh, plant and then weaken it so that it, it gives you none of the positive side of its power um, and, and then turn it into calibrated so that it is um, addicted, addictive so that you want to fire up another one every half hour? And lace it with dangerous chemicals. I mean, you, you couldn't, you couldn't do worse, really, uh, with a powerful plant teacher. Um, and uh, clearly, turning it into this uh, thing that people uh, want to uh, uh, consume every half hour um, is part of the problem. Not just because of the quantity uh, of, uh, of what you smoke. But also the regularity. I mean, if you're forever bombarding your lung cells with uh, toxins, uh, you're really increasing the risk of mutations uh, happening. Uh, because, you know, healthy cells divide. And usually when a, a dividing cell gets bombarded by toxins, it stops the division and it, it aborts the operation. Um, but if you're permanently and forever, every half hour, you're bombarding your lung cells with toxins, um, at some point there are going to be cells in there that will get caught right in the middle of their uh, duplication and their DNA will be exposed and then there will be insults to the DNA and that those are mutations and that's one of the ways in which cancer is caused. So meanwhile, back in indigenous Amazonia, they're taking big doses of powerful tobacco, but only at certain moments, ritualized moments contained in space and time, um, one evening, two evenings a week for two or three hours. Uh, and, and this is um, a, a different order uh, compared to permanently insulting your lung cells with the regular smoking of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, industrial cigarettes, it, it's, it's almost like a 180 degrees apart from uh, Amazonian um, tobacco. And that's interesting because what we have is 1.2 billion people in the world right now smoke cigarettes on a daily basis. And, it, it, you know, if you take the Amazonian perspective, they don't know what they're doing. Because, in fact, it, it still is tobacco i mean even though it's been watered down and, and so forth i mean you know it's not another plant it's not a cannabis or opium or what have you um but uh 
so they're they're interacting with tobacco. Tobacco is part of their life, but they're getting nothing from tobacco. They're using it all the time, and they're poisoning themselves with it. Um, you know, this is exactly not how you work with tobacco right. from the Amazonian perspective. It seems like the Amazonian use of tobacco is more of like a, like you said, a psychedelic experience, and probably it's obviously not a dopaminergic kind of, you know get the person addicted to the substance experience it's you probably do it in that ritualistic perspective it has a cultural and ritualistic uh, aspect to it that it's contained in but also it probably isn't something you would want to do more than like, like exactly yeah all exactly the time right yeah exactly right you see w when you get uh, a real nicotine delivery you know uh it's not something that you want to repeat uh, every half hour for the rest of your life. Uh, sort of like the experiment with uh, cocaine versus psilocybin with uh, rats, right? The, uh, rats will take the psilocybin, they'll take the cocaine over and over and over uh, uh -huh. and, until they die and not eat food, and they'll do the psilocybin once, you know, or the or the you know, other like LSD, I think it was psilocybin or, L or LSD in the experiment. And then that's it. That's That was nice. And we're not going to, we're going to, we're going to press that button to get that again. We'll go eat some food and drink some water, you know, have some sex, enjoy our life. Yeah. Smart rats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so meanwhile, on ayahuasca, mm. um, ayahuasca among uh, people in the Western Amazon, because that's where the, the plant mainly grows, um, they've been uh, using ayahuasca for centuries and perhaps longer than that. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's perhaps the number two shamanic plant. I mean, it's not that Amazonian people are creating classifications like this, but it, it's true. Uh, tobacco is the number one and uh, ayahuasca comes right after it. And they kind of go together. I mean, there's... Um, a representation of the of the cosmos by the Shipibo people of the Peruvian Amazon that I reproduced in uh, my book, The Cosmic Serpent. And so you see the earth and you see the sort of uh, uh, cosmic uh, dome and different uh, shapes. Um, and then they have two arrows that kind of cross each other like cardinal points, north, east, west, south, except at the tip of the four hour arrows, instead of the cardinal points, you have uh, anaconda, jaguar, tobacco, and ayahuasca. And these are the four, uh, or the, the two axes, one could say, of their view of the world. Uh, the jaguar and the anaconda are top predators in, in the Amazonian ecosystem. In other words, these animals eat every everything else, but they are not eaten themselves. Mm -hmm. And tobacco and ayahuasca are the two power plants of reference, and they go together. So um, it's true that... Um, People will talk about ayahuasca as a, just like they talk about tobacco as a, a powerful entity. Uh, you know, they, they say that each species has a, a kind of a personality associated with it. Uh, they call owner or mother or okay. father. They use those words interchangeably. So the mother of tobacco, the owner of ayahuasca. So, um, what about these, you know, so you want to know what they think about ayahuasca, they'll soon start telling you about the mother of ayahuasca. So what about the mother of ayahuasca? Well, like all these other powerful plants in their view, these are uh, powerful, ambiguous, uh, dangerous, but also fascinating entities that can uh, teach you many things, but also um, get you into trouble. You know, they're tricky. Um, it, it just seems, uh, from an Amazonian perspective, that, that, that you'd even need to explain that they're tricky and dangerous uh, is, um, you know, it's, it's not necessary because it's just so, so obvious. They're, they, they are, uh, when you start um, interacting regularly with these entities, that means, so... What is the uh, interacting with ayahuasca? It means ingesting it. That that's how you 
interact with these psychoactive plants. You ingest them and then you pay attention to how they impact on your body and on your mind. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing. I mean, we, we may think it's a little bit strange to think of plants having personalities, but with plants like tobacco and ayahuasca, once you've ingested them, you can at least study the impact that the plant has on your personality. So, you know, you don't even have to believe that the plant has a personality. Um, but all you have to do is pay attention to what happens to you when you ingest it. Um, I can say on the basis of my uh, personal experience that uh, – Ayahuasca is, uh, has a kind of a, a wise, uh, somewhat trickstery um, uh, personality or, or, or way of uh, impacting on me. Um, it uh, often uh, will show me things about myself that I, I'm usually not in a hurry to see. You know, you, you see what a, how stupid you are. You can like you, suddenly you see a film of yourself in a situation, and and you you see yourself from above, mm -hmm. and you you see the mistakes that you made in certain situations. Um, just how this happens is mysterious. Uh, you know, I'm an agnostic, uh, scientifically trained uh, kind of guy, and I'm in no hurry to actually believe anything. But uh, these experiences are are interesting. I mean, it's certainly. When uh, people take ayahuasca, including myself, they tend to have the experience of being in the presence of an independent intelligence. In other words, it's not just your own brain played back to you backwards mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It actually does seem to have a wisdom of its own that's somehow independent from you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying outside of you because actually it's clear that it's also inside of you at that point when you ingest the plant it's inside you mm -hmm. but it's also it also seems to be giving you information that's coming from the outside um you know all this needs more research and actually that's also the mystery of of consciousness the mystery of how psychedelics actually work um this is uh, far from uh, uh resolved but in any case um Yes, um, ayahuasca is a powerful, natural hallucinogen. It's a, it's a vine, but it's also a, a mixture, so that can combine, that can contain other plants. Mm -hmm. um, it's now recognized by science as, uh, and by medical research as having a strong therapeutic potential for depression uh, and also for people suffering from trauma and anxiety and uh, perhaps even addictions. So um, there's been an explosion of research on ayahuasca in, in recent years. And um, perhaps what lags behind in that explosion of research is a true dialogue with indigenous Amazonian experts. And that's one of the things that we try to put on the table with the book Plant Teachers mm -hmm. is that Actually, it's fairly easy for a Western fellow and for an Amazonian fellow to sit around a table and to exchange. And, you know, so how do you think about this? Oh, well, I see it like this. And, oh, well, science, on the other hand, this is what it says. Oh, and that you can actually get a back and forth going mm -hmm. um, that is productive for both sides. And it's, it's fairly easy. All you need to do is sit down and start having a dialogue, just like you and I are doing today. Well, are, um, are those dialogues actually happening or, or are they happening as much as, as, as should be happening? Well, you know, I try not to use the word should that much. Um, but uh, because, you know, things happen as they happen, what, uh, in other, at their own rhythm. You can't sort of pull on the grass and make it grow faster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll just pull it out. Um, but what, what seems pretty clear, it's interesting to look uh, at uh, what has happened in the last five or ten years, the new science of ayahuasca, the kind of snags it runs into, besides uh, not, uh, not really being able to dialogue that easily with indigenous experts. I mean, you know, here's a very concrete thing. Um, the first thing that they want to do is, like, 
put people in brain imagery machines. You know, want to know what's going on in their brain when they're under ayahuasca. Well, fair enough. But as you know, these, you know, uh, fMRI machines is sort of not very enjoyable to, to stay in for long periods. And ayahuasca is a vomitive. I mean, I, it, it actually, it, it's a purge. That's what they, they it's, it's appreciated as such. They, they call it in the Peruvian Amazon, they, they call it la purga, the purge. Uh, you know, rather than the vine or or whatever, it's the purge. And, you know, people like purging. They like cleaning out their digestive tract and, uh, and so forth. I mean, there are a lot of stomach parasites down there, and that also makes sense. In any case, here is this brew that is considered medicinal because it's a purge. But when they started doing scientific research on it, um, you know, they, they put vomiting under adverse effects. In fact, you, you can find these articles where they, they call, so they, they start to study it and do the brain imagery or, or, or different studies mm -hmm. of ayahuasca in a lab. And invariably, they'd say uh, vomiting is the, it's the only adverse effect, in fact. So, but, so wait a second. This is considered to be probably its number one virtue by indigenous Amazonian people. And like an artifact, it's turned into an adverse effect. Also, not just because vomiting in a lab is sort of, you're not, you're not supposed to vomit in the lab. Uh, I mean, you know, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is that they're studying it as a psychedelic. Well, it may be a psychedelic in the sense that it, it reveals the psyche, but it's also about the body. I mean, indigenous people never said this affects your psyche. They don't, don't even have the concept of psyche. They don't oppose body and mind. Uh, they think of person. Um, or, or perhaps, like Ashaninka people, they think of, they, they'll talk about skin and they'll talk about heart. So there's uh, outside and inside, but they, they, they don't have body and mind. So when you, you take ayahuasca, I mean, obviously it goes into your stomach and it, it makes you vomit, but then it also shows you images. But before being a psychedelic where you see images and so forth, it, it's, a, it's an intensely body-based experience. But, but this gets uh, obscured by scientists who consider ayahuasca as a psychedelic and who then go on to view vomiting as an adverse effect you know so this is the kind of distortion that um, and i'm not you know trashing scientists here it's just like they they have goodwill they would just want to study ayahuasca as you would not do normally study anything but the problem is that Ayahuasca doesn't let itself be taken into the into the lab that easily. It's like a wild horse or something. Um, it's hard to study it in, in a lab. And so for the moment, there have been, uh, you know, here's, I'll just give you one last example. Ayahuasca is conceived as a cocktail. In other words, the vine itself already contains several alkaloids that are psychoactive. And then people mix other plants into uh, an ayahuasca vine tea to understand other plants. So for there, there is no standard ayahuasca. It can contain coca leaves or tobacco or datura or um, Psychotria viridis chacruna DMT containing. It can contain different psychoactive molecules and not just the ones that are in the vine. There is no standard ayahuasca. That's the whole point. Um, uh, well, along comes science, and scientists, they want to have standardized, they want something, they can't study it if it's not standardized. So then they've created this kind of fiction, all right, so they, they even say, yes, we used a, a batch of standardized ayahuasca. They've defined that standardized ayahuasca is a mix of the vine with DMT-containing Psychotria viridis. You know, they've said the main ingredient, which is also another scientific obsession, is DMT. But this is a, a big distortion. Some ayahuascas do not contain DMT. Uh, all ayahuascas contain harmine, harmaline, tetrahydroharmine, which are uh, psychoactive substances in their own right, but that have been understudied because of this DMT uh, uh, emphasis. 
And so this is just another example where scientists with the best intentions um, have started to study ayahuasca, but simply by studying it as they usually would in a scientific way, uh, they've immediately brought distortions to it. Well, um, it, it obviously, so, it takes it takes the, the plant out of the context of it being a plant in an environment and... And a whole lot of other things. It, it, it doesn't interact with the plant on its terms or the, the mixture. Probably it's different for each culture. Right? Each tribe has a different way of working with it. The elders have different ways of working with it as a plant teacher, I assume. Yeah. That's it. So, um, but uh, all that, it, this is, these are like uh, the growing pains of a young science. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what's going on? The interest, the scientific interest uh, in ayahuasca is um, uh, thrilling, and uh, I hope it will continue. And these are, these are growing pains that need to be uh, worked out. Um, and I do think that um, le um, leading the research hand in hand with indigenous uh, specialists uh, would be a way of uh, moving forward um, faster and better, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited to see what's going on with all the psychedelic and, and the kind of pseudo-psychedelic uh, research, that, like the MDMA and ketamine and other things. But uh, we shall see what happens with it uh, as it plays out. Will it still be effective? Will it be some kind of regression to the mean with these new, you know, well, what, you know, know the, the effectiveness got, or whatever? They've got remarkable results on depression down in Brazil with ayahuasca, uh -huh. where, where a single dose uh, sends people with chronic depression into remission for uh, eight months. Wow, wow. So... You know, that's a, c compared to the other uh, medicines, antidepressants on the market. I mean, there, there's just like uh, no competition. Absolutely. No, I agree with that. Yeah, but we'll see how the maybe we'll see how they play out in regards to like a Western context or, you know, a lab context versus how they play out indigenously. Maybe it's different. Maybe there's some element. You know, that, I yeah. think, uh, well, it may well be that... Um, We'll need a new way of doing science to understand ayahuasca. We're going to have to go outside of the lab and and do it differently. Well, that's kind and of exciting. Kind of, yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So, look, um, I've, I've got to run. I know you do, but I thank you so much for your time. This is fascinating. I could, I could sit and and listen and chat with you for another couple of hours, uh, Doctor Narby. I and I thank you for your time, uh, and I thank you for your book, uh, Plant Teachers, which is available from New World Libraries everywhere. Well, Scott, it's a, a pleasure talking with you, and I hope we get to talk uh, again soon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, always welcome back. Okay. And take care. So. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know that the Psychology Talk podcast has a Facebook page and an Instagram page? It's true. You can find more information about other guests and episodes, as well as more information about psychology and mental health. And if you liked this episode, go ahead and like us on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Stitcher, or Spotify and leave a review. It helps us grow our audience and provide more quality shows. All material, copyright the Psychology Talk podcast. This podcast is for informative and entertainment purposes only. If you need a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. <laughs>